Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching it. Welcome to episode 51 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting on about things that are important to me, I think deserve your attention. Um, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show, uh, by all means, you can email me. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, and I expect that you didn't, uh, my uh, website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple of times during the show. And uh, you can go to the website and get the email address from there. I do answer my email. I'm sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. And uh, the one thing I ask, though, is that if you do email me, that uh, in, please, in the subject line, include something like your cable show or your cable access show or left side of the aisle so I don't mistake it for spam, as, in fact, I almost did just the other day, mistake a letter for spam. Well, this is left side of the aisle for the week of April 5th to 11th, 2012. Uh, and... Um, Again, we're going to be talking about several different things. I'm going to start, actually, with uh, something I talked about last week, or rather, at the end of the show last week, I said I'd be talking about it this week, the Jobs Act. This uh, is the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act, which some had referred to as a rather comically forced acronym, but it's the Jobs Bill. And this, this passed the House overwhelmingly, bipartisan support, passed the Senate, overwhelming bipartisan support. Barack Obama loves the thing. It's everybody loves it. It's a jobs bill. How can you not like that? It's a jobs bill. It's all about jobs. Well, last week I said the bill was actually well named because it's J.O.'s pushing B.S. Uh, the supposed purpose of this bill is to enable our dynamic entrepreneurs to reinvigorate our economy by being better able to finance startup businesses. How does it do this? Well, first, by saving these entrepreneurs money by exempting them from certain federal requirements about uh, accounting and reporting duties, and by making it easier for them to raise money, first by lifting a ban on advertising for, uh, for investors, and second by allowing for what's called crowdfunding, which essentially involves going on social media and trying to raise a lot of money from a large number of small donors. In short, what, these, what this bill allows uh, is for these people to raise millions of dollars without having to tell these investors very much at all about the company or its finances. All those nasty disclosure requirements are gone. All those accounting requirements are gone. All that's left is the brightly colored brochures and the flashy web ads promising that you too can be as rich as Mitt Romney. What could go wrong? One, one economist who, who writes uh, on economics for a business magazine said this bill will open the floodgates to massive fraud and actually said that allowing for the so-called crowdfunding would make the boiler room scams of the 1980s look like, look like um, parking violations. Uh, one uh, person who is a state-level uh, securities regulator said that this bill sacrifices essential consumer protections and actually lessens the ability, it hinders the ability of state-level regulators to actually oversee these investments. Basically, it means they can do it without any oversight or regulation at all. In fact, one former official of the Securities and Exchange Commission said that this bill, I'm going to have to quote this, this bill would better be known as the Bucket Shop and Penny Stock Fraud Reauthorization Act of 2012. Another former SEC official called it a disgrace. There was also this open letter, this wonderful letter, is written by six white-collar criminologists. These are the people whose job it is to suss out like securities and banking fraud and other financial fraud. They sent this open letter. They said, we want to thank Congress and the president for passing this bill, which will basically guarantee us job security for life. On a more serious note, 
They described the bill as an atrocity. That's a quote. They said it was only something a financial scavenger could love. That's another quote. And said it was composed of a wish list of fraud-friendly provisions that people who wanted to cheat have been dreaming about for years. And the Consumer Federation of America pointed out that this bill is being done without even any evidence that there really is a problem with honest entrepreneurs raising money. It's a solution without even showing there's a problem. And we, the thing is, we've been down this road before. For the last, like, almost 40 years, we've been doing this. We've been deregulating. We deregulated some industries, some uh, financial industries, and we got the savings and loan crisis. Well, we deregulated a little more, and we got Enron and WorldCom and all of those things. What did we do then? Well, we deregulated a little more, and we got the whole financial meltdown of 2008. And the response to this record is, where else haven't we deregulated? Um, and the thing is, even the people who support this don't really claim it's going to do anything. Nancy Pelosi, um, she, uh, she voted for the thing and then afterwards described it as meager. In fact, this bill would likely have the perverse effect of not improving job creation, but making it worse. Because by raising the risk of fraud, it will inevitably raise the risk, uh, raise the cost rather, of capital. And any honest entrepreneur who really wants to start a business is going to find the cost of capital going up as a result of this, making it harder for them to start a business instead of easier. And all this is happening at a time when the economy still, for lack of a better term, sucks. Uh, unemployment rate in March is expected to remain constant at about 8.3%. At the current rate of job growth, it's going to take seven years for that unemployment rate to get back to where it was, to where it was. Um, and the graph, by the way, the graphic, as just an indication of how the distribution of income has changed and who's gained and who hasn't over these years. And the thing is, even if we get jobs, the number of jobs back to the pre-recession levels, um, what kind of jobs are there going to be? Because that matters too. Well, according to a projection by the Labor Department, over the next uh, 10 years or so, over a quarter of all the new jobs created will be in low-paying sectors of the economy, the ones with low pay, lousy pensions, and few benefits. That's our economic future. In the meantime, five and a half million people have still been unemployed for more than six months. Three to five million people are discouraged workers. They're, they're, they've even given up trying to find work. Meanwhile, an increasing number of Americans say that they struggle to buy food. Uh, about 19%, that's almost one in five, told a Gallup poll that they couldn't always afford enough food to feed their families. Nearly one quarter of American families pay more than 50% of their income on housing, on rent or, or um, a mortgage. Earlier studies tended to indicate that about one in five Americans lived in a family that was struggling to pay a medical bill. According to a recent government survey, that number is up to one in three. More than 20 million Americans are in households with incomes less than one half of the federal poverty level. The portion of our population in that condition is the highest it's been in at least 35 years. Meanwhile, the average pay of CEOs is now about 1,000 times that of an average worker. As recently as 1970, it was about 40 times as high. And this is at a time, this is all at a time when there's more than enough work to be done. There is more than enough work to be done. There's about $2 trillion in infrastructure repair that needs to be done. Works on bridges, tunnels, rails, all the rest of this. Uh, but the thing is, corporations are not going to do that. They're not, because they don't see a profit in it. I've said this over and over and over again. Corporations are not going to hire you if they don't see a need, a, a demand for what you can do, if they don't see a profit in hiring you. In fact, uh, there's, uh, there was a, uh, a guy who does job counseling, and he said 
the, the toughest question going around in 2012, the toughest question going around job interviews, uh, I'm going to quote this, your job exists to help your employer achieve and maintain profitability. How do your efforts support those goals? Now, it means, you know, these interviewers, at least they're being upfront about this. The purpose of your job is to create profit for your company. They don't see a profit. They don't hire you. In an economy like this, I've said again this before, I'm probably going to wind up saying it again. In an economy like this, there's only one agency that can actually spur demand, and that's government. And the most efficient way for government to spur demand is to actually hire people to go out and do that kind of necessary work, like, for example, $2 trillion in infrastructure projects. But is that what we're talking about? No, that's not what we're talking about. We are talking rather about opening up the door for massive fraud in the hope that it might produce a piddling number of jobs. And beyond that, what are we talking about? We're back to deficit reduction. We're back to talking about how we can cut spending. And we'll get to that after the break. So the, um, the big topic now, again, is, is cutting, cutting things. How, how much can we cut? Where can we cut? We've got the, the so-called Ryan budget. This is put out by Representative Paul Ryan, or Paul Ranton, as I like to call him. So we've got the Ranton budget. And this has been passed by the House. It's going to die in the Senate, but that's hardly the point now. Uh, the, the, the Ryan budget proposes cuts in food assistance, Medicaid, housing, jobs programs, job training, education, environmental protection, basically across the board, everything just getting cut and slashed. It wants to replace Medicare with a voucher program. And despite all these cuts, it would actually increase the deficit by $4 trillion because of the massive tax cuts it wants to give to the richest people in the country. Now, Barack Obama the other day called this, uh, called this budget uh, social Darwinism, which is actually a, a pretty good description of it, I think. And I would actually have to tell you the truth. I would be very, very happy uh, with the way uh, Barack Obama, President Hopi Changey, the way he denounced this budget, if I really had any faith he was actually going to try to do anything about it. But the truth is I don't. Because his argument is not cutting social programs, it's how much you cut and where. He has acknowledged he wants to cut Social Security, he wants to cut Medicare. He wanted them to, wanted them to be part of any budget, uh, any, any program on balancing the budget. He said this over and over again. So, you know, he doesn't disagree with all of these cuts, just, you know, how, just where and just how much. But Ryan himself, he had to walk something back the other day. He suggested that in considering the military budget that um, the, uh, the generals weren't being honest. They weren't being honest in, in how they described it. And he had to walk that back real quick. Uh, he said what he was trying to say, he said, was that uh, Obama had announced there was going to be $500 billion in cuts over 10 years. It was actually $487 billion, but close enough. $500 billion in cuts over 10 years, and that the Pentagon then had to create the strategy to meet that figure. And he said it should have been the other way around. That is, the Pentagon, unlike every other department in the federal government, the Pentagon should be able to say, this is what we want, and you just have to come up with however much money it's going to take to do that. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch Fishface McConnell he said, we're going to make sure America remains number one in defense, and we're not sure that these cuts are going to be able to do that, stay number one. So they want it to be number one in defense. Being number one anything else? Yeah. Being number one in, in, in clean air, clean water? Yeah, not important. Being number one in access to health care? Not important. Being number one in the lowest rates of poverty or hunger? Not important. Being number one in the ability to kill people? That's what's important. Uh... In fact, there's this guy, Buck McKeon. He chairs the, the House Armed Services Committee. And he was out in California talking to a group of Northrop Grumman workers. 
And he said, I implore you, no, I beg you to stop cuts in military spending from happening. Because, yeah, they want to cut, but that's, no, you can't cut military spending. Everything else gets cut, but not the military. The problem is, it's not just the goppers doing this. Leon Panetta, he's the Secretary of Defense. He said recently that it would be irresponsible to cut any more than the amount that was already agreed to, that $487 billion over 10 years. But the fact is, the entire Defense Department is rife with waste to a degree that if it had been any civilian program, there'd be demands that it be shut down. At a hearing on his nomination to be the head of procurement for the Department of Defense, a guy named Frank Kendall testified to Congress, I'm quoting, I am not confident any defense program will not have cost overruns. In other words, you can be confident that they probably will. According to the Senate Armed Services Committee, half of all Pentagon programs have had cost overruns of at least 15%. We spend more on defense, on defense, than, than anything, else in, anything else in the budget. We spend more on defense than we do on Social Security. We spend more on defense than we do on Medicare. For fiscal year 2013, that's the budget that's now being worked on, there is a budget calls for $851 billion for security spending. Now, security spending is all of it. It includes the Department of Defense and other security issues like the Department of Energy, which runs the nuclear weapons program and things like that. The Department of Defense base budget proposed for 2013. Obama has asked for $525 billion for the Department of Defense. That is a cut from the year before of $5 billion, less than 1% cut. And in fact, in 2014, the year after, the Pentagon budget is supposed to go up to $533 billion. Wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to be cutting military spending. How come it's going up? This is something you've got to realize. When these people talk about cuts in military spending, they don't mean cuts. They mean smaller increases that it won't go up as much as had been previously predicted. That's what they mean by cuts. I mean, how big is our military budget? How big is our budget compared to the other nations of the world? According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, this is, this is an outfit, an internationally respected outfit that keeps track of these kind of things. The United States alone accounts for 43% of all military spending in the entire world. Britain, France, China, um, and, and Russia together account for a little over 18%. We alone account for two and a half times as much spending as they do combined. This, this is insane. This is insane. The numbers are all out of proportion to any rational notion of defense. And in fact, there are ways to cut the military budget, ways to cut it that do not affect any rational notion of military or, or security defense. In fact, in 2010, there were four different proposals of how you could cut military spending. There was one by the Sustainable Defense Task Force. This was put together by Barney Frank and Ron Paul. It outlined a plan to cut $960 billion over 10 years. The Libertarian Cato Institute had a proposal for $1.2 trillion in cuts over that time. The, the centrist uh, bipartisan policy center proposed $1.1 trillion over that time. And um, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles, you remember, remember, they were the co-chairs of the so-called National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, otherwise known as the Cat Food Commission. Even they, in their report, they suggested cuts of somewhere between $650 billion and $1 trillion over 10 years. There are ways, there are solid, well-thought-out ways of how you can cut the military budget without any impact on any rational notion of national self-defense. But the fact is, the right wing won't listen to them. And the fact is, a lot of supposed liberals and, and, and moderates won't either. There is, however, one part of the military budget which the reactionaries are, they're really willing, they're eager even to question. The, Depart the Department of Defense's adoption of solar energy and other renewable energy forms. 
In fact, the Army wants to have at least 25% of its energy supplied by renewable energy by um, 2025. And, well, we can't have that, can we? So last week, the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Readiness held a hearing uh, intended to question any expenses about alternative energies under the cover of saying it was about energy security. Now, a lot of the, you'll pardon the expression, energy went out of this hearing when it turned out that, for the most part, the programs that the Pentagon is involved in involve private investment. They cost taxpayers basically nothing, and that the energy the Defense Department is getting from these projects is going to cost less than if they had gotten it from the regular grid. It actually is saving money. And in fact, you know, the fact is there have been times, there have been times when the military has actually taken the lead in progress. And in this case, alternative energy is one of them because they recognize security threats and about relying on, on fossil fuels. So they're actually taking the lead in a form of progress here. That's not the only occasion. There was um, the fact that the, the military, in fact, was integrated well before the rest of society was. It really started during World War II. It was formalized by presidential decree in July of 1948. By 1953, almost every soldier was serving in an integrated unit. The first significant civil rights legislation since the post-Civil War era, uh, era rather, didn't come for another 11 years. So sometimes the military has been out in front. But all right, but I don't want by talking about that and you know integrating the military and so on, I don't want to suggest or let anybody think I was suggesting that uh, racism is no longer a problem in our society. It is a very real problem in our society and our lives, and we can see that just by looking at the case of Trayvon Martin. Now here, I'm not even concerned really with uh, George Zimmerman, with the shooter himself. I'm more concerned with the reaction. First, the reaction of the cops. Um, they took at face value his claim of self-defense. The cops drug tested the dead victim, but didn't drug test the live shooter. They did a background check on the dead victim, but not on the live shooter. They let the live shooter walk free without charge, without arrest. And I have to ask you very simply and very seriously, if the situation was identical, except the colors of their skin were reversed, do you really think that's the way that would have played out? You know the answer to that question. And you know what that tells you about our society. Another concern I have is with the broader reaction. The broader reaction in the society as a whole. There have been numerous attempts to smear Trayvon Martin. He's been called a thug. That's a popular one. In fact, one cop called him a thug who deserved to die. There have been charges that he had a history of violence. This apparently re based on some reference to a single incident where somebody threw a punch at some bus driver, that, and it may not even been him. There are claims he was a drug dealer. There have been menacing pictures of him, increasingly menacing pictures, some of them so menacing they actually weren't even him. These are all intended to whitewash the crime, intended to make it okay for Trayvon Martin to be dead, to make it okay for George Zimmerman to have shot him, to make it okay for George Zimmerman to have killed him. Because in these people's minds, it can't be wrong for a white guy to have killed a black kid. So I'm going to ask that question again. If everything about this had been identical, except the colors of their skin were reversed, do you think those people would be smearing the victim? And again, you know the answer to that question, and you know what it tells us about our society. So again, I'm not talking here about, actually about George Zimmerman. In fact, at this point, I'm not caring about George Zimmerman. There's a lot of indications that George Zimmerman may be, may be a racist, but even if he's not, it doesn't matter. That broader reaction still exists, and it still shows our society, and it still shows it in a very unhappy light. All right, now I'm going to move on to our weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. 
And this is something you, I expect you have heard about, uh, but there's an aspect of this that you may not have heard about, and that's why I wanted to bring this up. Supreme Court just ruled that by a five to four, the typical five to four ideological driven decision, they ruled that it is okay for prisons to strip search people coming into prison, no matter how minor the offense. It could be as minor as an unpaid traffic ticket. It doesn't matter. If you are going to be in the general prison population, they can strip search you. This is without you being convicted of any crime, remember, just arrested, and they don't even have to suspect you have contraband. They can do it anyway. The case arose from a guy named uh, Albert Florence. This is in New Jersey in 2005 it happened. He was the passenger in the car. His wife was pulled over for speeding. The cops did a background check on both of them and discovered he had an outstanding warrant for an unpaid fine. The fact is the fine had already been paid, and this actually had happened to him before, so he made a practice of carrying with him the proof that this fine had been paid. He showed it to the cops. They didn't care. They arrested him anyway. He was sent to a county jail. He was strip searched. He was held for a week. During that time, he was, held to an, he was switched to another prison where he was strip searched again, even though he had just come from prison. And now this is the law of the land. Now they can do it. This, you probably heard about that, but this is the part I wanted to bring up. Anthony Kennedy, who wrote the majority opinion, said first that admission of inmates creates numerous risks to personnel, to prisoners, and to the person going into prison. And so there was all this risk, even to the person entering in. In other words, part of this argument is you're being strip searched for your own good. But this is the real reason I bring this up. In justifying this, in justifying strip searching people, cavity searching people, uh, when, when, when Florence was brought into prison, he was told to squat and cough and spread them. And this is all okay. And to justify this, Anthony Kennedy, actually, I am not joking, he invoked 9-11. Even after all these years, 9-11 is still the justification for everything. 9-11 still justifies everything. Every intrusion into our rights, every invasion of our privacy, every indignity visited on us, it's all okay because 9-11. And that is the outrage of the week. Uh, let me close with a very quick bit of good news. You probably heard about, about this. Uh, the uh, vote last week, uh, over this past weekend in Burma, uh, where uh, the Nobel Prize winner, um, An Sung An Ki, um, I'm sorry, uh, um, Su Ki, uh, she just, uh, her party, contested 45 seats, uh, 44 seats in the legislature and has won somewhere between 40 and 43 of them. This is really good news. And by the way, um, call it Burma. Myanmar, which is the proper pronunciation, Myanmar is what the military regime called it. Burma is what the democracy activists call it. So you call it Burma. And I'm just about out of time. Don't forget our open house, June 16th, Saturday. You come on down here, um, 12 to 6, and uh, meet all of us and see what's going on. Get involved. But for now, you just have the best week you can, and I will see you next week.